Okay, I think we are ready to start today, so good to see the few and the faithful, but uh, that's fine. Okay, let's go ahead and open with the word of prayer. Is it, is it on? Does it sound on? Can't hear? They said it's not on? Now it is, okay. Sort of? Okay. Okay, they're turning it up, they say, but uh, I guess the Lord can hear us without uh, microphones, so we'll open with the word of prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for your exceeding abundant goodness to us again this past week and just the marvelous ways you meet each need. Thank you for Jesus Christ and all he's done for us, the difference he makes in our life, and so the privilege we have to be here today to exalt you, to um, revel in in. Uh, the fact that we can be rightly related to you because of what Jesus did on the cross and to then um, hopefully be challenged to go out and live lives that are uh, well-pleasing in your sight. Do thank you as always for the word of God and we just pray as we study this matchless book that we would be open and attentive to what you have to say, that we would always sit under the authority of it and want to be taught. And so we ask for your, uh, your help and provision today now in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Okay, we will start with our homework today, and since we are uh, fewer in number, that means if you're here, you are going to have to really step forward. That's the homework, and then the lecture is uh, right in the middle of that one. Okay, so um, with, the, with the things today that we're talking about, these might not seem all that uh, big a deal in one sense as far as you know, wow, if I, if I take a little different view than somebody else or whatever, uh, am I going off into theological culthood or error, uh, etc.? cetera? Uh, they're not quite as significant maybe as some of the other things we've said, but all of these also have to do with, as we've, as we've noted, uh, the more we understand the culture of uh, the, the Bible world, the, the better we understand what's being said. And so some of these expressions are just more cultural expressions, uh, but they're a kind of a, an interesting way of trying to make a certain point. And so um, hopefully as you studied each one, uh, you, you indeed maybe had just read it multiple times, but it never jumped out at you before. But now all of a sudden you said, whoa, wait a minute. Um, I'd never, never really uh, seen that or thought of that before. So let's begin Exodus chapter 11 and verse 7. And remember for each of these, um, the, the greater context is often, can often be very helpful, uh, remembering where we are. So Exodus chapter 11, remember, is at the end of the plagues. The uh, Israelites are about ready to, to get out of Egypt, but the final plague, that death of the firstborn. And so we read in chapter 11 and verse 7, where God says in verse 6, There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue. So what in the world is that expression? Um, what, what in the world does that expression mean? What do, you, what do you think the point is that's being made here? Okay, Marilyn? Okay, the, the point uh, Marilyn says is that uh, it's just reminding us of how distinct Israel is from the, the rest of the people, uh, that even a dog will not, and, and a lot of modern translations do use the word growl, that even a dog will not growl or be heard against the children of Israel. And actually the latter part of verse 7 goes on to say that ye may know that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. So in other words, as the context indicates as well that, that God is even saying by this very thing because I mean let's face it uh, you live in a neighborhood probably where there are dogs it's never your dog that barks but uh, I mean you start up your lawnmower and the neighbor's dog just starts yapping or you go on your patio and sneeze and another neighbor's dog starts uh, barking and it's like every little thing if you will can distract a, a dog get their attention and so the point here yes yeah, seems to be uh, simply something like uh, not only would a dog not harm the children of Israel, 
but uh, there, there would be such a distinction that normally you would think a dog would even bark or do something. But in this case, it'll be so evident that here are these Egyptians that are just howling and wailing because they've lost a loved one. And here are the Israelites, and there's not even a dog that's growling or, or making uh, any kind of noise. Okay? Um, so, yeah, that one's not super difficult in, in one sense, but it is interesting. Let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25 and verse uh, 22. Let's see, Kevin, I think you need... For this class on hermeneutics, everybody needs to do homework, and so that was the homework due today, but we will excuse you since you weren't here last Sunday. And then our lectures will be lecturing on the middle of what's in there. Okay, for this next one, this is really kind of an interesting expression that occurs uh, multiple times in the uh, Old Testament. First Samuel 25 and verse 22 uh, this is when David has just treated um, uh, Nabal's uh, shepherds. Uh, he, he's treated them nicely, and, and they have mistreated him. And this is one of those times where it was almost like David, as he, as he was going to simply take things into his own hand, and God providentially uh, spared him or kept him from doing something that he would later regret. And so in verse 22, David says, So and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that pertain to him by the morning light, any that pisseth against the wall. Okay? Now, what in the world would that expression, would that, uh, expression mean? Okay, yeah, ba basically just a male. And a lot of the more modern translations kind of do away with it. There, there are some translations uh, that even in the, uh, in the footnote it says this was a coarse Hebrew expression. Uh, for for this uh, and it could possibly it could possibly be but I don't think we would say it was like swearing or or anything of the sort it was just uh, the, the way of really making a strong point uh, referring to uh, referring to every male and um, as one writer says this is a stereotyped formula which refers to all the male members of a household and if you'll track down every one of the references where it occurs it always refers to the killing of all males of a group. So that's why when you're reading the Old Testament, you don't just find this expression used if it's going to say males as opposed to females. It doesn't use an expression like this. So it does seem like it's, it's almost the writer's way of getting our attention. Because if you, if you got rid of all the male members of a household, I mean, wow, just think of how important even in some modern day societies a male offspring is, you know. Uh, it, it's, it, they're very, very significant, of course. And so probably there is, there is some of that thought when the writer uses this uh, as well. It's not just to say every male is going to be killed, but it's to kind of um, uh, get, get the, the, the reader's attention. Okay, and then going back to Leviticus chapter 7, this is a much more significant one. See, and some have come in late. Everybody has the homework from last week, so you know what we're talking about as we're walking through these. Leviticus 7 is the next one. Okay, Leviticus 7, and this expression occurs about uh, 19 times or so in the, uh, specifically, I believe they're all in the Pentateuch or close to it. In Leviticus 7 and verse 20, it says, The soul that eats of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings that pertain unto the Lord having his uncleanness upon him, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. Okay? Now, there's generally about three different ways that this is interpreted. So uh, how about you helping me? What are some of the, the different ways that, uh, or, or how, how would you interpret this? That soul shall be cut off from his people. Okay? What do you think it means, Marilyn? Okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, what do you mean when you just say it could be death? Okay, okay, we'll just, we'll just put to death here. We might need to uh, circumscribe that a little more in a second, but Phil? Okay, excommunication.
Okay, well, that would sort of be uh, excommunication, possibly. Um, yeah, that, this is kind of a big, a big category, and we'll, we'll delineate these a little bit more in, in just a second. But that's why we might need to circumscribe your simple death a little bit here. What? Wouldn't be included in the atonement? So in other words, uh, when, they, when they die, they're unsaved? Is, is that sort of what you're saying? Just, just for that? Just for that offering? Okay, but remember, this is not just this one time. This also occurs with various sexual sins, etc. Okay, anybody, anybody find uh, any, any others? Okay, um, we'll, 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 we'll assume that this is what you mean, uh, Marilyn, okay? Uh, death by capital punishment. In other words, um, the, the person is found guilty, goes before a judge. The judge says, I'm not just going to throw you in the slammer for life. You're going to be executed. That's really what you meant, right? That's not really what you... Oh, no. Okay, well, the, the, third, the third possible interpretation here would simply be a direct intervention by God. Okay, so uh, maybe we'll just put... Direct intervention by God, okay? And you say, well, what is the difference between these? Okay, well, let's kind of go back to the excommunication first. So, yeah, there are, there are plenty that believe it is some form of excommunication from the covenant privileges. And there are some who actually believe that, um, the, the, and that's why I asked Glenda the question I did, they actually believe that, that probably or possibly under this, it has to do with not just temporarily, but eternally. In other words, if you violated some of these things, it was so bad that you were cut off from God eternally. It was saying that you are going to a place of eternal punishment when you die because it is such a serious thing. So it not only had something to do in life, but it also included your eternal, um, your eternal separation from God. And so that could, that could possibly be one way of taking it. Uh, there are others who say that this is uh, death, specifically by uh, like, like capital punishment. Um, and, and what we're talking about here is uh, simply a human agency. In other words, with various things, uh, you, you violate a law, the, the, you, know, you come to court, the, the case is made, the judge says, yeah, you really did violate this, and the punishment is uh, capital punishment. You're going to be killed, executed for it. The problem that some scholars have with that as well as with this is that when you look at the, all the times when the expression cut off from his people occurs, some of them would be very, very hard to prove in a court of law unless the person said, yeah, you're exactly right. I'm guilty just like you said. In other words, they're the kinds of things that you can't, you can't prove because they're religious sins and some of them are even sexual sins. And so, therefore, uh, there are those who would say it really can't be this because uh, how, how are the judges going to know? How could you prove it? I, I mean, if you stole somebody's sheep, you uh, rammed your chariot into their chariot and, and you know, caused harm or something, yeah, it could be proved. But in the case of certain things, it couldn't be. And so, therefore, there are others who say it refers to a direct, uh, a direct inter uh, intervention by God. And some here would say... Uh, because it's not all that clear. So some speculate and say, actually, um, this, this could refer to like childlessness. Because remember indeed how important, how important it was to pass on things to the next generation. Uh, others say that actually, no, it's a reference to like premature death. Okay. So there are, there are various possibilities uh, but the point here is that, that basically you are uh, committing this person over to God and then God in his own way and in his own time is going to uh, do something uh, about it. Okay, uh, And uh, we might say, because maybe the thought is, well, how would this really be a great punishment? Uh, well, as some, as some writers have said, uh, the threat of just being cut off by God in his time and in his way, and you had no idea of knowing when, why, how, 
would would just be almost like a guillotine over your head and you're saying when is somebody going to you know cut the rope and it's god who's going to do that and 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 so it's it, it's kind of like maybe somebody and this is not a complete parallel but maybe it's something like if you go to a doctor and he says you have cancer there's no hope for you you're going to die and you say well doctor how long and he says i don't know some people who've who've had your kind of cancer walked out of my office and were dead the next day there are others who've lived for three months and so it's kind of like whoa you know there's this cloud hanging over your head of a sentence but you don't know when how uh or, or you know it's, it's going to be it's going to be brought upon you and therefore it would it would just be kind of a threat if you will uh for for the person who did these kinds of things uh it's not like any one of these is a liberal view and another a conservative view uh it's but it is important as you're studying the old testament and old testament laws and especially old testament um uh, penology that is their system of punishment uh, to, to be considering uh, passages uh, like, like this. So, questions, comments? You see the point we're making here? You see the possible differences between them? And it, it really is, uh, it is difficult um, to, to know. But, but uh, like I say, when you, when you trace all the occurrences, some seems it predominates religious sins like violation of the cult, that is the religious worship, or sexual sins. And uh, God wanted him to know it is a, a very serious thing. Okay, let's go to 2 Samuel 3.33. Maybe we can move through some of these others much more quickly. And the nature of them, 2 Samuel 3 and verse 33, uh, where we find uh, David lamenting over Abner, and he said, Died Abner as a fool dies? So why would, why would he say that when he's lamenting the death of someone and say, did he die like a fool dies? Go ahead. Okay, um, yeah, this is, this is one where when you look at the context, you find how uh, as David is being established in his kingdom and Abner had been the military general really for Saul, etc. And now David's military general uh, was so upset with Abner that he ended up uh, uh, killing him through trickery, deceit, etc. And, and it's like, you know, David is saying, wait a minute, my hands are clean of this. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, this was totally unsuspecting. He was taken off guard. He was kind of sneaked upon, if you will, and when he was murdered. Uh, one modern translation says, should Abner have died like a thug? In other words, generally, if somebody is murdered, you say, well, they were out there, you know, robbing something, whatever. And, and here's a guy who was innocent. He actually was trying to do what was right and bring the kingdom together. And so he was very, very unsuspecting. Uh, and, and David, is, as part of his mourning, uses this expression. Okay, over a couple pages, 2 Samuel 5 and verse 6, and I'm moving along real quickly here so we get to our lecture, but 2 Samuel 5, 6, David is now being established in his kingdom. His, the first seven and a half years, Hebron was the headquarters, and now he's going to take Jerusalem. So the king and his men went to Jerusalem to the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, because they were controlling it yet, they were one of the Canaanite nations. And they spake unto David and said, Except you take away the blind and the lame, you shall not come in here. Okay, so what's going on here? What's going on here? Okay. Okay, they're mocking his power. And, and why, would they, why would they say the blind and the lame here? Okay, yeah, you're, you, they're, they're basically thinking of, shall we say, two classes of people that are just helpless, blind people and lame people. And here's David, the mighty warrior, and they're, they're taunting him. They're saying, 
hey, even, even our most despicable, if you will, people, the people who are, have the least strength, could even defeat you. And of course, that wasn't the case. So David went in and he did, uh, he did, take, the, uh, he did take the city. But that's an interesting uh, expression. Go back to 2 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 8. Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 8. And uh, now this is, I probably should have put them in a different order, but I, was, I had rhyme or reason for doing it as I did, but I forget now what the rhyme and reason was. But, um, but now Abner is still alive in 2 Samuel 3 and verse 8. Um, but this is when he basically was making a ploy to, be, uh, to, to take the kingdom over since Saul was dead. And so if, if Saul is now dead and he was Saul's general, who's going to take over the kingdom? Well, one of the ways that you could basically say, I'm next in line and I have the authority, is to take the dead king's concubines and go into them. Okay, And that's exactly when you read the previous verses. Uh, it came to pass, verse 6, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner made himself strong for the house of Saul. Saul had a concubine. Uh, etc. And, um, and so uh, Saul's son said, why have you gone in unto my father's concubine? Well, that was actually his way of saying, I'm going to be the next king. I'm going to try and take over for your dad. And so in verse 8, when he was called on the carpet for it, Abner was very wroth for those words of Ishbosheth and said, am I a dog's head which against Judah do show kindness this day unto the house of Saul, your father, to his brethren, his friends, etc., and have not delivered you over. So he's saying, I could have delivered you over to David and basically said, let's wipe out the house of Saul. He's passed now. But he said, no, I'm fighting to try and keep the house of Saul on the throne. And so he used this expression. And so what does he mean when he says, am I a dog's head? Um... That, that against Judah would show kindness this day. Yeah, he's, he's basically saying, am I that despicable? I like one modern translation that said, have I been behaving like some Judean dog? And of course, remember, in that society, a, a dog was a very despicable animal anyhow. And so he's saying, am I the kind of person that would be a traitor and would be fighting for the southern kingdom for David and the Judeans? Uh, against you you're going to accuse me of this so he says no way and um, and that's when he immediately then the next scene here is he went to David uh, and he said okay David I'm going to throw the kingdom to you I'll put my weight behind you and everybody who previously was following Saul I'll tell them we're all going to follow David okay second kings 8 13 second kings 8 13 this is the prophet Elisha, 2 Kings 8, 13, uh, the prophet Elisha was speaking to Hazael because uh, Hazael was a representative of the king of Syria. Okay, so just think in your mind of this map. Here's our uh, Mediterranean Sea over here, etc. Syria is up here. <clears throat> and then we have the ministry of Elisha going on. And so... Um, the, the king of Syria was sick, and he said, Go to Elisha and ask Elisha if I'm going to be healed of my disease. And so, um, the, the king of Syria's uh, uh, ambassador, the king of Syria's representative named Hazael, went to meet him. And when he went to meet Elisha, he said, uh, My master sent me to see if he shall recover of his disease. Verse 10, Elisha said, Go and say unto him, You may certainly recover. So go back and tell your master, yep, he's going to recover. But the Lord has showed me that he's going to die. Now that sounds like a discrepancy for sure. What's going on? Verse 11, he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed. And the man of God wept. And Hazael said, why are you weeping? And he said, because when you, Hazael, are the king, you are going to do incredibly wicked things to God's people. And then verse 13, Hazael said, but what, is thy servant a dog that he would do this great thing? So, what is, uh, what is meant by that expression? Why would he say, is thy servant a dog that he would do something like this? Any idea? Marilyn, you did your homework, so...
Okay? Self-deprecating. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's acting very humble like, what? You know, would, would I do that kind of thing? And who am I that I would even have the power to do that kind of thing? So, so this is kind of one of those uh, false uh, humility things. As one writer says, he simply feigned humility by calling himself a mere dog who would not be capable of doing something like this. And so as soon as he went back to his master, and his master said, well, what did they say? Am I going to recover? And he said, yeah, you're going to recover. And then what did Hazael do to him? Took a very wet cloth during the night or the next morning and laid it on the face of the king of Syria, and he killed him. Guilty of, guilty of murder. And probably then, after he did that, and after he knew the king was dead, he, he removed the cloth, so when the servants went in and said, wow, how about that? You know, the king just died of natural causes. And yet, he had just been, he had just been murdered by Hazael. And then, as we know um, from, from uh, history, etc., Hazael really was a really bad guy who did incredible evil to the children of of Israel. So, uh, so yeah, here's, here's one where he's feigning like or acting like he's so humble, etc. But really, this guy is a, a snake in the grass, to put it mildly. Okay, 2 Samuel 9 and verse uh, 8. 2 Samuel, back to 2 Samuel 9 and verse 8, where um, David is speaking with um, the ancestor of, of, um, of Jonathan, so, so Saul's house, where, where David had promised Jonathan that he would treat uh, Jonathan's house uh, with, with kindness. And so David is doing that, and so he called uh, Mephibosheth, verse 8, and he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? So Saul's descendant is saying, uh, he's calling himself a dead dog. And again, I included some of these simply because this is interesting how many times the Hebrew language uses the word dog to refer to something that is oftentimes despicable, very despised, uh, very low. I mean, you know, um, uh, the Bible generally doesn't use other cattle in that way. And I was trying to think what would be maybe an uh, English equivalent that would be used when you think of an animal. If somebody wants to use an animal to, to, to refer to somebody who's, who's despicable, bad, you know, ruthless, would we, would we say, oh, you're such a sheep, or oh, you're such a cat? A pig, possibly? A rat, possibly? Can you think of another one that, that, that maybe it came to mind and I couldn't get it out that I think is maybe even more? Dis more? A snake? A skunk, maybe? Any stronger words? It's okay to say it in a Sunday school class. Yeah. I, I wonder if, if that's not one where, where we would, if, if somebody would have been called an ass, or if you would even refer to yourself like that, if you were kind of self-deprecating, uh, and, and you just wanted to act like, oh, you were so humble, and you say, do you think I'm an ass? And, and in reality... We, we know what, what, uh, you know, what, what the point is. So, so I wonder if maybe in our culture that would kind of be the expression that would replace the way the Hebrew uses this concept of a dog. Since remember, we think of a dog today as being, oh, that cute little poodle jumping on the sofa or you know, something like that. We don't think of them as being a despicable, despised scavenger uh, and so forth. Kevin? Mm -hmm. Right, and you missed, you missed our homework about two weeks ago when we brought that one up, uh, when I said, when is a dog not a dog, and I gave about five other Old Testament references, uh, and yeah, that's, that has a little different connotation, but it's uh, using a dog again, yeah. Yep. So you can go back on YouTube and listen to that lecture and then tell me if it was a good one or not. <laughs> Okay, 2 Samuel 12, 31. 2 Samuel 12, 31, where um, we read, 
Oh, 2 Samuel 16, 9. We missed one. Okay, let's go to 2 Samuel 16, 9. Um, Then said Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Okay, remember, 2 Samuel 16 is following 2 Samuel 15. Whoa, is that profound, huh? 2 Samuel 15 is Absalom's rebellion. So now in 2 Samuel 16, David is fleeing the capital for his life because his son has this coup, okay? And so as he's going, this man named Shimei and notice back in, in 16.5, it says Shimei was of the family of Saul. So there is still this anger between Saul's family or Saul's descendants that, David, you stole the throne from my grandpa. You took the throne that should have been mine. And so as, as David is leaving Jerusalem, Shimei comes out and it says he is cursing him and... Um, Notice in verse 7, Shimei, when he cursed, he said, Come out, thou bloody man. Come out, thou man of Baliol. I mean, those are two really strong expressions. When you call a man uh, a man of blood or bloodthirsty, you're calling him a murderer, and some modern translations take it that way. This expression, man of Baliol, was an Old Testament expression that was very, very strong for somebody who basically is, is lawless. They have nothing that restrains them. Uh, it, it was not good to say, well, yeah, my son is the son of Baliel, okay? Uh, that's saying, I've really, really blown it in, in raising him. And so Shimei is calling David that, and in verse 7, um, I mean, in verse 9 then, uh, one of David's military men says, why should this dead dog be able to talk to the king like that? And again, it's just an interesting expression because he's saying, here is, a, here is somebody who is totally despised and worthless, Shimei. And just look at the foul language he's using for the king. Let me just go and, and sever his head from his body. It's not, he shouldn't, he shouldn't be alive anymore. And of course, uh, David says, no, maybe this is God trying to teach me a lesson. Um, and so I'm not, going to, uh, I'm not going to take this into my own hands and execute him. Okay, then 2 Samuel 12 and verse 31. This is after David has taken Ammon. And it says, He brought forth the people who were in it and put them under saws and under harrows of iron and under axes of iron and made them pass through the brick kiln. Okay, what are two possible ways that this could be taken? One of them, basically the older interpreters took it this way. The more modern interpreters seem to take it a little bit differently. But did you find two different interpretations here, Mark? Okay, and that's probably the, 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 the more popular one that, that most writers would take today. Simply saying, David appointed them to various kinds of labor, whether with instruments of iron, etc., or actually uh, working in a brick factory, putting bricks into the kiln, etc. What do you think is another possible way to, to take it? Torture, yeah. There are, there are some who, who think that, that actually David, because this is often the way ancient Near Eastern kings did when they conquered somebody else, they literally would simply execute some of the, the, uh, the uh, real healthy uh, younger guys. And so it simply means that David killed some with this, he killed some with that, he killed some by, by, by running them through the fire, etc. So uh, that is a distinct, a distinct difference uh, here in how you're going to interpret it. And then 2 Samuel 8, 2, again after David has conquered, this time the Moabites. And it says, um, He smote Moab and he measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground. Even with two lines he measured them to put them to death and with one full line to keep them alive. What does that mean? Okay, uh, supposedly maybe just put it, just as we might say, stand them against the wall and, and simply count one, two, three. And then he said, if you were a, a three, step forward. And those he would say, okay, go over to this holding pen and the others would be executed. So in other words, two out of three he killed. Uh, what is, is possibly uh, another way that it, would, it, was, it would, could be taken? Any other
Okay, maybe only half the population based on the measuring because it's not clear. It says he cast them down or it would appear that he had them lay on the ground and it almost sounds like he measured them and if you were tall enough, he executed you. If you were shorter, he didn't execute you. So maybe it was the children that were saved, uh, but the older ones that could, could rebel, etc., like would be part of the army were executed. So yeah, we're not exactly, we're not exactly sure what is, is going on here per se. It's, uh, it is, it is kind of difficult. Kevin? Yeah, and uh, yeah, the Greek, the Greek is very, very precise in, in things. And again, part of this, um, I, I think, just has to do with our culture. We're, you know, 3,500 years, 3,000 years removed from them, a Western culture versus an Eastern. And so when you start putting a lot of this stuff together, that's what, uh, that's what, that's what really can create problems. Okay, well, maybe that will, again, just give you an idea as you are... Uh, studying the Bible to be watching for phrases like this or as you're reading through the Bible in a year and you read certain translations and maybe you say, wait a minute, I never remember reading that expression before and then you look and say the King James and you say, whoa, the two expressions are entirely different. So what in the world is going on here? And that can, can get you to grapple somewhat with uh, some of these cultural issues. Okay, does everybody have the... Um, the sheet, this was from a couple of weeks ago. The front sheet had the cartoons on it. And in the very middle of the sheet there, it says, Faldy Approaches to Bible Interpretation. Everybody have one of those? If you don't, I have extra copies here. So that's what we're going to look at. Lord willing, we've got about 24, 23 minutes to get that completed. So next week we can start something else. Okay? Okay, and by the way, I didn't, uh, I didn't come up with, I struggled uh, with shall I give them homework for next week or not, but I'm going to give you a week off class because you've been doing such a good job. And also, really, this was the real reason. This is a holiday week, and I know what students are like after a holiday. They didn't do their homework anyhow, and so I didn't want to be discouraged next Sunday by everybody saying, hey, yesterday was a holiday. I didn't have time to do it. So take the week off, okay? And uh, we'll give, give you homework again next week for the following Sunday. Okay, remember as we have been, we talked about uh, earlier on this particular handout, the importance of foundation stones when we deal with in, uh, hermeneutics or interpretation. And we said that uh, at the top of the sheet, we laid these three foundation stones summarized simply as human, divine, and then authority. And we said it is very, very important because these are things the Bible tells us are the underpinnings, or these are the presuppositions. We didn't just come up with these because, you know, we're part of a Bible church. It's a matter of, no, this is what believers throughout history have said. This is what the Bible tells us. There's a human aspect to the Bible, but it's far more than a human pre a production. It is a divine production. God authored it. And also, it has authority. God has the right to tell me what to believe as well as how to behave. And as we said, if there are cracks in the foundation of any kind, wow, that can really create some problems. I think of like growing up, my, my aunt had a house in Archibald, Ohio, and uh, I forget, it wasn't all that many years after it was built, and, and in Ohio, most houses have basements, uh, block basements, etc. But it started leaking water, and, and through the years up until just a few years ago, because the house is still in the family, there have been problems with occasionally water seeping into the basement. And you'll hire somebody and they'll come and they'll dig all around the foundation and say, I'll slap a little tar there and that'll help. And, you know, a couple months later, you're back to the same problem. Uh, there's just a foundational problem that really makes a difference. Or I was just thinking, um, and I didn't, haven't followed very closely, but that 12-story Miami condo this week, did I read correctly? It was built in the 80s. And by the mid-90s, the they were already having foundation problems with its sinking, etc. And you say, oh, that's no big deal. Well, it would be a big deal if your loved one was lost, died in it, or if your loved one is still unaccounted for, or if your apartment fell off and you lost everything. 
In other words, foundations are big deals and you don't just walk away and say the crack doesn't matter. The crack does matter. And with these four faulty views or faulty approaches to interpretation, it's, it's really bl uh, cracks in the foundation or in the case of many of them, it is basically, well, let's get rid of this foundation stone and let's replace it with another foundation stone and this other foundation stone actually already is a faulty stone to begin with, even before you put it in the foundation. And so it's guaranteed you're going to have problems. It's guaranteed the superstructure you build on it is going to collapse. And the major or the common denominator for all of these four faulty things we're going to look at is simply subjectivism. Okay, subjectivism, uh, which simply means that man is put in the place to determine the, the meaning of a passage. Instead of saying, well, what does God mean by this passage? It is a matter of man is going to read into it what he wants to read into it. What are, what are those two words that we talked about maybe two, three weeks ago that we refer to that major difference between reading into the passage what you want it to say and pulling out of the passage what God intended it to say. What, is the, what, is the, the, what are the words? Okay. Eisegesis and exegesis. Okay, and that simply is a, a Greek preposition that has to do with into, where you read it into and ex is out of. You want to pull out of the text. And so when you have a subjective interpretation, you're simply saying, well, this is what I think the text means, no matter what I read somewhere else in the Bible, no matter how much it seems to contradict it, etc. And that is, that is a false way to come to the Bible. Okay, so very quickly, number one, naturalistic. Uh, the meaning here is simply limited to human insight. So what that means is divine authorship and supernatural events uh, are ruled out. Okay, now how significant, how significant is this? Well, uh, this is very, very significant <clears throat> because uh, when, when we make rational or reason our ultimate authority, uh, we are so limited to begin with and we are so uh, fallible even in what we think we know. Okay? Uh, I mean, it's, it's good to use your mind. God expects us to use our mind. God wants us to be rational. He doesn't want us to be irrational. But I kind of think of it like this, and again, this is probably not even a good illustration because it, is, it is, is so much greater than this. But let's just say that this box represent God's knowledge. In other words, um, this box would represent everything there is to know if we would be omniscient. Okay? And then let's just say our sphere of knowledge, and again, our sphere of knowledge isn't anywhere near that close to absolutely everything, but we've got to draw it big enough to represent it, okay? So let's just say that that little circle represented our so-called knowledge. Just look at how much we really don't know. And then let's just pretend, and I probably can't even do it properly, just put a, a little red dot within that black dot, and let's say that that red dot is representative of things that really we do even understand about we, what we do know. I mean, think of how many things that you know that you don't even have proper understanding of everything because you don't know all this other stuff that should be applied at the same time. So the point I'm trying to make is knowledge is infinitesimal, if you will, and our knowledge that we have is so finite. So when we say, I'm going to come to the Bible and I'm going to interpret it on the basis of my human insight, what I know because I am so smart, it is like, oh man, you know, you're pathetic. You don't really know anything about anything, okay? And so that's what makes it, if you will, so, so dangerous. Now, this, if, if you're going to follow this kind of thing, this, this reasoning, um, basically uh, people who follow that have uh, major problems with huge chunks of the Bible. In other words, think of, for example, uh, parts of the Bible that, that are, are called acts that are morally unworthy of God. Can you think of anything in the Bible that people would say, 
uh, that is something that doesn't seem morally worthy of God. Think of Israel when they uh, went into the promised land. Wipe out the nations. It's technically called the ban, where Israel went in and wiped out men, women, and children and took cities. And people say, what? What kind of God do you serve? He's a bloodthirsty you know, uh, individual. He's the big bully on the playground beating up these little children. Can you think of anything else, especially in the Psalms? Well, possibly the flood. Can you think of anything in the Psalms, a category? Imprecatory Psalms, imprecation. Boy, are some of those strong, where, where the writer says, uh, uh, you know, may, may God do this to you. Like Psalm 137 is about the strongest, speaking of Babylon. May God take your little babies and dash their head against the rocks. You say, whoa, what, what book are you reading again? How do I explain that? That's morally unworthy of God. So if you're going to try and explain everything on the basis of your peanut-sized brain, you're really going to struggle when it comes to various things in the Bible because those are hard enough to explain even when you sit humbly before God, let alone when you, when, when you think that you're, uh, you know, that you, that you're the, 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 the centerpiece. Another area people will have problems here is the miraculous. Okay, And as I always say, Beware that if you try and explain away a miracle, the explanation you give generally takes more faith to believe than just believing God could have performed that miracle. I mean, you can't believe, or it's hard to imagine some of the explanations so-called Old Testament scholars give for Old Testament miracles. And you read it and you say, did I read that correctly? That's not even laugh-worthy. That is so stupid so foolish to think that that's that's how you would explain it it's easier to just believe god who created the universe and the laws of the universe can suspend or override them at any time he wants to do what he wants to do but if you really follow a rationalistic system of interpretation you're gonna you're gonna be throwing out a good bit of the bible and by the way i won't charge you extra for this this will be your homework right on the spot what are the three major times in the bible when miracles occur because there are three major times in the Bible, three clusters of miracles. When, when are they? Okay, so we have at the time of the Exodus and wilderness wandering, uh, time of Elijah and Elisha, and in the first century world with Christ and apostles. Okay, why were those uh, three key times in history that God would emphasize miracles in the Bible? Okay, bringing out Israel, and as he's doing it, what is he trying to prove? Why, why use miracles? Okay, it's happening by God, not just historical events. And who, who does the book of Exodus say he really judged as he was doing some of these things? Pharaoh and Egypt's gods. Exodus 12, 12, against all the gods of Egypt... God executed judgment because supposedly, uh, basically, every one of these areas of the plague, it was an area where there was an Egyptian deity in control. Kevin, uh, well, we need to answer our quite. We need to answer this first before we take your question. Hopefully, you'll forget it by then, and then I don't need to worry if I don't know the answer. I'll, I'll get back with you, but but okay. So that's that's true here, and God is displaying His power to His people. Because remember how much the, the people of Israel needed to know how powerful their God was as he provided for them in the barren wilderness. Okay, why during the time of Elijah and Elisha were miracles so significant? Okay, Israel was following false gods, specifically Baalism. And who was the number one proponent of Baalism? Trying to jam it down everybody's throat through Supreme Court decisions. and con oh, Well, no, they didn't have that in those days, did they? but trying to get her way. Jezebel and Ahab, when they, when, she, when they made it basically the number one religion of the northern kingdom. And so God was again fighting against the Baalism and saying, wait a minute, Baalism is not the way to go. And then, of course, Christ and the apostles validating who Christ really was. You can think of New Testament verses about that, the apostles to prove that they were carrying on, etc. Okay. Okay, Kevin, did you remember? Okay. On the Mount of Transfiguration, these characters in these two periods appeared there. Okay. Where do you 
Okay. That's why I said I didn't want you to ask the question because I don't know the answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, we could look back and, yeah, you could say, well, why wasn't Abraham as the father of the nation? But then you could look and say, why weren't some of the other key figures maybe in Israel's history? So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you can't uh, sleep this afternoon, I'll let you uh, think about that for a while and try and come up with an answer. Okay, so, so miracles, very, very uh, significant. And if you don't believe uh, what, what God has said about the Bible, you're going to struggle. And thirdly, suppose contradictions of biblical statements. There are a lot of things in the Bible that, that if, when you read them just on kind of a surface, it looks like they're contradicting each other. And so if, if you're going to just base everything on your rationalism, on your reasoning abilities, there are some of the things that are, are going to be pretty hard for you to, to come up with a proper interpretation of. So, so that's why rationalism is not the way to go. That's another sub-point under uh, naturalistic is biblical criticism. Okay? Now, biblical criticism, per se, is a very legitimate and a very good thing that helps us. So when we think here of uh, biblical criticism, but basically there are two branches. One branch is called higher criticism, and one branch is called uh, lower criticism. Okay. Now, um, when it comes to like textual criticism or the lower criticism, that is very, very legitimate because it's saying, well, what's the historical context behind the writing of Moses, uh, behind the writing of Genesis or 2 Samuel or Amos, etc. Uh, who's the author? Who, who, uh, what's the date for it? I mean, that's all legitimate. Okay, so don't think of criticism the way we think of it in the English language usually is always being negative. But it's, uh, uh, lower criticism is very, very important. Okay, it's legitimate. But when it comes to higher criticism, um, Oh, I'm sorry, the lower criticism is more dealing with the text. Uh, part of higher criticism is legitimate where you're dealing with authorship, dates, circumstances. But part of high, higher criticism is very destructive where they deny uh, authorship to certain books. And they say, well, we're going to figure out who really wrote the Pentateuch. It couldn't have been Moses. So it was written over the period of about a thousand years by different, and on and on they go. Well, that's, that's wrong, Okay. And so if you are following that kind of thing when you interpret the Bible, you're going to really mess things up in your, in your interpretive scheme. Another one here is cultural relativism. As we've said before, cultural relativism is very, very helpful or can be very helpful because it wants to bridge the gap. So right back here we have the biblical writers. And here we have you know, us today and we say, who's going to build the bridge over this big chasm? We're talking about 2,000 to 3,500 years ago. We're talking about an Eastern culture as opposed to a Western culture. So how in the world can we expect to understand something that God wrote so, so long ago? So with, with, uh, uh, as, as we study the culture, it is, it's legitimate. It's good to ask that question. The problem comes about, however, when some people want to say that culture is morally neutral. In other words, they're basically saying that um, it, you know, it, it, it really doesn't matter what, what their culture was per se, uh, or there's no, there are no principles we can learn from it, etc. Now, when it comes to certain cultural things, it really is morally neutral. I mean, there are some cultures in the world that eat two, made, two meals a day and others that eat four meals a day. Is that a really big deal? Well, if they're eating dessert, it is for me. But otherwise, no, it really doesn't matter, okay? Or maybe there are some cultures where, you know, they bathe once a week, whether they need it or not, and others that bathe twice a day. Does that really make a big deal? Not unless you're riding on a bus with them on a hot day, okay? But, but I mean, it's, it's, those are culturally things that are morally neutral. But when it comes to other things, 
they're not morally neutral. Uh, they, they are part and parcel of a culture, but they're actually uh, contrary to what God has said. And so therefore, we need to be very, very careful because if we come along and just say, well, all or so many of these biblical things in the, that we struggle with are just their culture, well, that's a really slippery slope because then all of a sudden we can say that doesn't apply to me because I'm not part of their culture. And that is not, that is not correct. Okay, so that's the first wrong building block, a naturalistic building block uh, that, that's basically getting rid of the, the divine part of Scripture and the authority part. Number two, supernaturalistic. Here, the interpreter is seeking a spiritual or a hidden meaning. Now, this sounds very God-honoring, and it sounds like, well, well yeah, I don't want to be man-centered. I want to know what God has said. But really... What this turns out to be is uh, pretty much, shall we say, uh, how fertile is my mind when I read the Bible? Uh, Remember, we've said that revelation is God pulling back the curtains of heaven because he wants to tell us what he believes. He wants to tell us absolute truth. Well, basically with this, what you you do is you you pretty much say, uh, you know, who has the most fertile mind here when it comes to explaining it? If you remember the cartoon I gave you, I think, on week number one when they were debating what Paul meant when he talked about pray for me and my chains, and some of the people said, oh, I think it means Paul was a chain smoker, and somebody else said, oh, it reminds me of this pop song and so forth. Uh, well, yeah, if, if you're not careful, that kind of thing can happen where you just, uh, where, where you basically are looking for some uh, really special hidden, hidden meaning, Okay. And there was a period in church history, and I think we'll just uh, jump over that for now, but there was a period in church history where, where over-spiritualization of the Bible, the allegorization of the Bible, was really the key way they looked at it. And so for everything, they came to it and first of all said, well, what does it literally say? But that's really not most important. What really matters is what's the spiritual, what's the moral point, etc. And before long, again, your mind is just... Uh, super fertile. But that does bring up, as I put on your sheet, how many meanings and how many applica- or how many meanings are there in a text? Uh, some people would say there's one meaning with many applications. So God intended one meaning, but then for us today, yeah, there are a lot of different ways it can be applied. If you're in America, it might be applied one way. If you're in Europe, it might be applied another way, etc. There are others who say, no, there are, there's more than one meaning meaning that God intended multiple meanings. But basically, you know, the writer might have known it, or maybe even the writer, the human writer, didn't know it. But the Holy Spirit, as you keep reading the Bible, starts drawing out the fact that there's more than one specific uh, intended meaning there. But again, we need to be very, very careful. We don't just come along and, and find multiple meanings because we want it. I think it's far better to to pretty much say, okay, what was the original meaning? And then basically it's applications that come off of it uh, as we bring it home to ourselves. And then the existential, the third one that you have there, you begin with human experience. And and this was actually uh, uh, a response to rationalism. And this is the, the good old pendulum swing where when you have a problem, so let's say over here, There was a problem with interpreting the Bible rationally, rationalism. How are you going to solve that problem? Well, instead of bringing the pendulum back to the middle, generally we we have a problem of swinging the pendulum over to an air over here. And that's really what happened now where experience became the key. Instead of basically thinking through something, the mind being the key, now all of a sudden we have the experiences becoming the key where you deny the objectivity of the truth of the Bible, uh, you deny the authority of the Bible, and basically the, the interpreter is at center stage saying, well, this is how I would view it. This is what I would say. And number four, very quickly, the last is dogmatic. Uh, conformity to my predetermined system of doctrine or authority. Now, let's face it, everybody does have a system by which they interpret the Bible. But the key here is you want your system to be able to to, uh, uh, properly interpret or more easily interpret every part of the Bible. So we come to the Bible, we study individual verses, 
As we do, we dig out, if you will, our theology. We systematize that theology and we make it a ho- into a whole. But then we still have a lot of other difficult verses. So how are those verses going to fit into my system? Do I need to basically jettison my whole system because there are too many verses that would seem to contradict it or create problems? Or can those verses somehow fit and maybe I need to tweak what I, the way I'd originally interpreted some other verses? And so this is very, very important. But the problem develops with A, tradition. Tradition can be good or it can be bad. Especially with young people or with new converts, it's really easy to jettison that which is old for that which is new. But something is not right just because it's old and something is not right just because it's new. Okay? And, and so new converts as well as young people need to remember that and just say, hey, I want the truth and if grandma believed it, I don't believe it because grandma believed it. I, believed it. I believe it because it was the truth and grandma was right. But you don't want him to say, well, grandma believed it and I loved her in her rocking chair, so I don't want to disappoint her, so I'll hold that position. No, no. You want to be as close to the truth as you can be, whether it's tradition or not. Another Christian can be helpful or harmful. Again, think of new converts who are looking for heroes. And sorry to say, that's the way it is with a lot of... Tommy's not listening, and I'm not talking about him, but a lot of pastors. It's basically, you know, theologian so-and-so says this, and theologian so-and-so says that, and theologian so-and-so says this. And it's like, it doesn't matter what he says, but it's because I love him and he's my favorite, he can do no wrong or say no wrong. No. Now, we all have writers we like, and there's nothing wrong with reading some of our favorite uh, writers. We need to be very, very careful that we always go back to the Word of God and we don't just develop uh, these these heroes. And then finally, personal experience can be very positive in helping me. But again, I need to be very careful I don't read something into the Bible because there are certain groups of people that have a lot of dreams and things of that sort and they interpret the Bible on the basis of dreams they've had and say, well, I had this dream, and and that was so real to me, and so I know that this is true. And you say, but that violates what God says in the Bible. But I experienced this. I had this dream, so I know it's got to be right and true. And we've got to say, wait a minute. The Bible is our ultimate authority. I don't want a foundation that is built on my personal dreams. That has too many cracks in it, too many faults, and it's going to bring the house down if I'm not careful. Okay, that was uh, several hours worth of lecturing in about 23 minutes there to summarize this, but this is kind of going at it from the other way. We've talked about some positive things. These are some negatives we need to be careful of, and as we keep talking about hermeneutics, we will uh, keep coming back to some of these things as well. Okay, Lord bless you on a homework-free week, but hopefully it's not a Bible-reading-free week, so keep reading your Bible. Keep watching for uh, hermeneutical uh, problems.